will grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today our reading out of the book of Nehemiah comes nearly at the chronological end of the Old Testament. God's word in the Old Testament has taken us through the moment of creation, through the story of Abraham, through Moses in Egypt, Joshua in the promised land, through David and his sons, the kings. And throughout these chapters, God's word is chronicled time and time again the faithfulness of God. It's shown his care and his love for his people in real and physical ways, even up against their disbelief and their own sin. The people of God find themselves in this perpetual cycle where one moment they're faithful, the next they fall into sin and disobedience, then they are returned through judgment and restoration. And God walks patiently alongside of his people through this process, drawing them back to himself. The cycle happens time and time again, but our section of Nehemiah comes at the end of one of the most pronounced sections of these cycles. You see, more than 70 years ago, the people of God and Judah were lost in their unfaithfulness. They had turned to other gods, worshiping the gods of the nations alongside the true God. And as their trust in God waned, their love and care for the most vulnerable of society also dried up. The poor suffered immensely. Widows were left to suffer on their own, and injustice reigned. Kings, instead of seeking God's care and safety sought alliances with superpowers in order to bolster their own safety and protection. You see, the king stands as a representation of all the people. And when the king turns his back on God, we know that sin had overwhelmed the people. Sin in all its forms is evil and destructive, and it leads people from the good of God's will for creation and leads them to hurt and to harm their neighbor and their walk with God. In other words, the people of God forgot who they were, and they walked in the path of the nations that surrounded them instead of the way that God had charted for them. And their sin led to their just judgment by God. Judgment has taken many forms throughout the history of the Old Testament. But here at the end, we see that God sends a Babylonian army. The judgment is not meant as just a punishment for sin, it's also a wake-up call for the individuals God is judging, that they would turn from their sin, that they would repent and trust in God. In this extreme case, the judgment that God sends, this Babylonian army, comes and conquers the city of Jerusalem. The city is sacked, the temple is looted, and the people are taken from their nation and brought into exile in Babylon. I think it's hard for us to imagine just how devastating this exile is, not only physically, but spiritually. Physically, they're carried far off from their homeland. All that they had known was taken from them in a moment. Their language and their culture has to rapidly change, and not according to their own will. Spiritually, think how devastating it would be to be forcibly removed from the temple, the center of life for the Jewish people the place where God connected and man came to be with in the presence of our God. To be cut off from worship, to be cut off from the place where you offered your prayers, to be cut off from the place where feasts and celebrations took place, and to be cut off from offering sacrifices to God. It's all now torn away. Even for an unfaithful people, this would be a devastating and dramatic change. But the purpose of this judgment is not to be cut off forever but instead for a restoration to take place, to finish that cycle we spoke about earlier. For many, the story of Nehemiah and Ezra is simply the people returning to the promised land and getting back to business as usual. Yet the restoration we see in our text for today is so much more than just getting back to normal. Instead, it's this rediscovery of what it means to be the people of God. It's a rediscovery of what it means to live and enjoy the promises that God has given to his people. And we see this restoration in the physical nature of the people as well as the spiritual nature of the people. The physical nature as they're sent by Cyrus back to the promised land of their ancestors. And we see a symbol for this restoration of the people physically as that wall is rebuilt. The city that was once lying in ruin is brought back to life. It's restored. 
and the people that live within its walls once again dwell peacefully in the land. Much is the same for the restoration of the spiritual life of the people. Cyrus, the Persian emperor, sends the people back with all that was looted from the temple. And we see this restoration in our reading this morning in this service where Ezra stands in the midst of the people and he reads from the law or the Torah. And through this proclamation of the word and the explanation that those servants give, God's people once again learn what it means to be his covenant people, what it means to be in a good and right relationship with God, what it means to be the people of God in this place they've been restored to. God has been faithful to these unfaithful people throughout the exile. And now, in his mercy, he restores his people Israel. And this restoration of both a physical and spiritual nature points to a future restoration that begins in our gospel reading for this morning. Nearly 400 years after the events of our Old Testament reading, Jesus is sitting in a synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him. And you can almost see in your mind's eye as Jesus rolls out the large scroll nearly to the end. And he proclaims this prophecy of Isaiah about the coming Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then stuns those who are sitting around him as he simply speaks today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This text points to a physical and spiritual healing of a people in desperate need. Isaiah highlights what is wrong and broken in the world due to sin. Sin damages and destroys all that it comes in contact with. The poor in this prophecy are taken advantage of and without hope. There are those who are held captive against their will. Those who suffer with medical issues like blindness and those who stand socially or economically oppressed. The consequences of sin in the world is suffering. And we see these sufferings in many and various ways. And we see these sins, these wrongs, in the people that were exiled, who were judged, as they had turned their back on God and embraced evil. And God had judged them justly. So as we examine ourselves this morning, are we any different? Are we, we are sinful in our own right. We hurt and harm our neighbor through our thoughts, words, and deeds. We tear down others through our words as we speak ill of them. When we harbor hatred in our heart against another person, we murder them in our heart. Our hearts even grow cold to those who are in need or suffering, and instead we turn our own wants and desires and place them over anyone else. We turn our backs on God through our sin and arrogance, thinking we know better, or worse yet, that we can find security and safety in anything other than the one who created us. Our sins echo the people of Judah. It echoes the prophecy our Lord read. And we're no better than the Israelites lost in sin. We deserve no better than a judgment of our own, not Babylonian armies, but the true reward for our evil is death. An eternal separation from our God, to be cut off both physically and spiritually from our Creator with no hope of return. Our evil is certainly great. Yet our gospel reading this morning points out that the sin and evil in the world, but Jesus does not offer judgment for them. Rather, he comes bearing good news of restoration greater than anything Ezra and Nehemiah could imagine. For the poor who have been abandoned, Jesus comes bearing good news that their suffering is not forever. For the captives who are bound, Jesus comes to declare liberty. For those who are blind, Jesus comes bearing sight. For the oppressed, Jesus declares liberty. Jesus does not come dishing out punishment that is rightly deserved, but rather he comes to solve the underlying cause of all of it. Jesus is to heal the broken and sinful nature of our hearts, to redeem and restore a people lost in their sins. As the purpose of Christ is revealed to those sitting in the synagogue, as the epiphany about Jesus' identity is made known among them, their response isn't elation to this good news, but rather wrath at who Jesus claims to be, 
How dare Jesus, that carpenter boy of Joseph, make these promises about himself? How dare he heal in other places, but not here? The wrath gets so strong against Jesus that they carry him to the edge of town, seeking to throw him off a cliff and kill him. But miraculously, Jesus makes his way through the crowd and out of danger. But the response from the people Jesus has come to save will not be much different. Jesus will be led to a cross and crucified. The one who comes to restore will be put to death in a horrific fashion. And here truly we see our sinful nature at work. Yet it is through this gruesome death that you and I are restored. Through the death of our Savior, all of our sins, our sins that weigh heavy upon us and that rightly deserve judgment, he takes all of those sins, that guilt and shame we feel, and he takes it to his death. And in his rising again, Jesus brings us from dead and our sins to newness of life with him. Through the empty tomb on Easter morning, we can be certain of our renewal through Christ our Lord. And this renewal for you and for me is both physical and spiritual, and far greater than what Nehemiah could experience. Physically, it isn't a wall that is repaired, but the restoration of all that sin has broken. Our suffering with medical issues, our pain and loss in this world, the evil we experience, and even the death all of us face are made right in Christ our Lord and in his coming again. Our spiritual lives are made new not through the rebuilding of the temple, but rather God the Holy Spirit making his temple in our hearts, that God restores a right relationship between us and him. And then as our epistle reading this morning speaks, that we're brought into this unique membership in this body of Christ. This, resur- this restoration also means that we get to look forward to a life everlasting with Christ our Lord. All of you, both physically and spiritually, receive good news this morning of Christ's restoration. Our Old Testament reading ends, as the people hear the law, they mourn. They know they are sinful. They know they have not lived in the ways that God had commanded. And to these weeping masses, Ezra stands and speaks, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way. Eat the fat. Drink sweet wine. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Today we get to celebrate an even sweeter celebration as we prepare for the Lord's Supper together here in this place. A feast that reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. As we gather around the Lord's table, we recognize that we are sinful beings. Yet it is here that God promises us restoration. As we gather for this meal, it forgives our sins. It reminds us that we are beloved children of God. And that no matter what present darkness might we face in our life, our Lord is dwelling with us. So in a few moments as we gather around this table, may you receive the good news. And may the joy of the Lord fill your heart and be your strength. And may our response always be the same as the people hearing God's word in our reading for today. Amen. Amen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.